architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello, this is Vikram Prakash, and you are listening to Architecture Talk. Each conversation, we bring in a contemporary scholar and talk to them about issues of architecture and design thinking. We're interested in what architecture has been, what it is today, but most importantly, what it could be and what it might be in the future. Today, I am talking to Carla Kevanian who has recently produced with her colleagues a fantastic new module for the GAHTC Collective on the medieval Mediterranean called A Crossroads. Uh, and we will be try and get an introduction to what The Crossroads was about and what its implications are for our contemporary understanding of the evolution of Western architectural history and history in general. Welcome to Architecture Talk, Carla. Thank you, Vikram. It's a pleasure being here. And I thought I'd just start off by asking you a crossroads. Uh, you're trying to talk about the medieval period. What do you mean by a crossroads versus what? Well, uh, that is actually a fundamental term in the concept that was behind the project behind this team project that brought together a number of scholars, each working on their particular field of expertise, mm -hmm. but coming together under a common umbrella, if you want, or definition to produce this team project. And Crossroads has to do with the fact that we want to try and put forward a different notion of the ways in which architecture has developed particularly so around certain crucial regions and crucial historical times. And so uh, ours was the medieval Mediterranean. The main point of the project was to show that architecture did not develop in certain regions as the exclusive product of particularly talented individuals, say, or a specific isolated culture, but that emerged as the outcome of very fruitful exchanges across the Mediterranean, that the Mediterranean shores connected various architectural cultures and civilizations, and this gave rise to very fruitful hybrids, uh, produced a very prolific um, moment in our architectural history. We wanted to emphasize the fact that exchanges weren't just going in one direction, but were crisscrossing precisely the Mediterranean. So it's a critique, I take it, of the conventional 19th century uh, historiography of the evolution of Western history as something that's autonomous and rose within uh, the history of, of, of Europe, particularly, and instead emphasizes that uh, the Mediterranean region was, in fact, completely interconnected. Yes, it is absolutely intended as a critique and as a way of concretely showing through the architecture how thick that network of exchanges was across the Medi Mediterranean region. Was this region very economically deeply integrated uh, at that time as well? Very much so, we believe. It was economically and to a large extent technologically integrated uh, I mean, since Roman times. What do you mean technologically? Well, uh, the technology meant it had, technology including in architecture, had ways of becoming widespread across the various shores of the Mediterranean, right? So you would have maritime trade and uh, the Mediterranean Sea, all water courses, but the Mediterranean Sea in particular was facilitated exchanges. So technology traveled together with ideas and goods and peoples. Right. I mean, for instance, in one of your lectures, I think it's in lecture three or four, mm -hmm. you talk about the development of the pendentive, right, as a technology that right. was a key technology that evolved out of the crossroads. Can you tell us a little bit about yes, that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of our basic ideas, one of the founding concepts for this project uh, 
was that, and something that we believe has a broader significance than just this particular uh, project, the medieval Mediterranean, is that uh, the structural components of architecture in particular represent inescapable evidence about cultural exchange- exchanges having happened. We've focused mm-hmm. very much on that because it is easier to change other parts of architecture than the structure. Structure requires in-depth knowledge, technology, as we were saying, and changes very slowly. Yeah, people don't want to take risks. People don't want to take yeah. risks because buildings will collapse. That's not something you yeah, want to risk. Right. You will keep yeah. building the way your fathers and forefathers have until somebody brings in a new technology demonstrating the fact that it works and it might produce new spatial concepts, new spaces um, that can now be built thanks to this different technology. So when you suddenly see appearing, for instance, the pendentive dome you were mentioning, another example we gave were domes on squinches that are Mm -hmm. a characteristic structure in the Middle East, in the region we refer to now broadly as the Middle East. And suddenly they appear in Europe, especially Mm -hmm. in Italy, which had a very thick set of economic and trade conflictual as well relations, but exchanges occurred. So when you see these domes and squinches suddenly appearing in Italy in particular and then spreading to the rest of Europe, you know something is is happening. You know that cultural exchanges must be happening. Right. And that... Versus the genius of, of Florence. Right. Versus the genius of Florence or the genius of Venice or the genius right. cities that we know for a fact had very active trade relations with what was then called, say, the Levant. So where, where did the pendant with the via the squinch come from? So one of the, one of the hypotheses we formulate in this project was that when the capital of the Roman Empire moved to Byzantium and there came into contact with um, other building traditions, Eastern building traditions that would... Umayyad and then the Armenian in particular. Or the Armenians in particular, exactly. Yeah. And then the combination of traditional techniques that had been used on a smaller scale in these Eastern regions, in the regions of the Eastern Mediterranean, combined with, you know, the grandeur of Roman engineers and gave rise to large-scale domes built on pendentives. Hagia Sophia Mm -hmm. is uh, a major example, of course. Right. We liked in particular the idea that we would be tackling precisely monuments such as Hagia Sophia that um, are, you know, protagonists of any survey course in architecture, most survey courses in architecture, to provide Mm -hmm. through them a different understanding of the sort of exchanges that had to occur for this fruitful new structural element to emerge and give rise to the enormous spaces, the enormous spatial effects that are exemplified in Hagia Sophia, for instance. In your introductory lecture, you have highlighted a professor, Joseph Strigowski. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about him and why you chose to give him such a significant profile in your module? It was a way of introducing uh, the issue, which is a fraught issue for ideological reasons. And that is to say, to put it somewhat crudely, but not inaccurately, the discussion about or the debate about where certain forms that emerged in the medieval period, a broadly construed medieval period, uh, came from, whether they where um, the product of Roman classicism that gets transformed into various ways, etc., and developed entirely, as we were saying, within specific regions and as the uh, product of even certain specific cities or city-states. Right. So that was one view, the Eurocentric view, if you want, the traditional. Right, right. And Strykovsky was the first who traveled extensively in the East and saw, in particular, became particularly fascinated with Armenian architecture Mm -hmm. and uh, started suggesting that Armenian architecture had functioned as a stepping stone between Islamic and Persian architecture on the one hand and the architecture that developed in Christian Europe on the other. Now, where was he from? Who was he, Joseph? Joseph. 
Strugowski? Um, he was Austrian, actually, and that was a bit part of the problem. Because in subsequent years, he also espoused more, um, shall we say, racially charged ideas or ideologies. Uh -huh. And so the whole of his scholarly production was discredited because he then associated himself to ideas about, you know, race and eugenics and so on. So is that the only reason why he was discredited or was this idea in the first place too challenging to right. the orthodoxy anyway? Right, that's a good point actually. The, the idea was very challenging. Um, so we're seeing that a century has gone by and uh, these ideas for ideological reasons, no other reason than that, seem to have a difficult time in asserting themselves. Mm -hmm. Which is why mm -hmm. we thought Precisely the use of architectural evidence, and especially structural evidence, which is undeniable, mm -hmm. would help us make the point. So right. we viewed our effort as part of, if you want, a sort of civic activism, a way of setting the record straight, a way of overcoming ideological resistance to certain ideas by showing the inevitable architectural evidence that would be helping us prove that point. Uh, we have a complete lecture on Armenia, and, and Joseph Strugovsky's work sets it up as an important place right. uh, in this exchange. Uh, and you have articulated it as the critical connecting point between the quote-unquote Eastern and Western worlds. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about Armenia in the medieval ages and, you know, what was going on there? What was the political conditions and why it found itself at, at a critical crossroads? Right. Well, here's the interesting uh, aspect. The interesting aspect was that it was a Christian um, nation, not a nation state in the modern sense, right. but it was a Christian community, the earliest supposedly, that had adopted Christianity as its um, religion. And so it found itself surrounded by, at a certain point, surrounded by and part of Islamic cultures and civilizations. Now, it became a very important trading post for merchants, especially from some of the uh, cities in Italy that were trading very actively uh -huh. with these regions, the eastern regions. Uh, Venice was in the front line. Uh, Genoa was another one. Pisa was another. And uh -huh. we also have documentation of uh, merchant communities drafting contracts with their counterparts, dra drafting contracts and agreements between, say, Venice, Genoa, or Pisa, and their Armenian counterparts about merchants being able to freely trade so because it was a Christian uh, Christian kingdom, that's why it was served as an effective conduit for uh, that, the northern that Italian That's certainly state. one of the reasons, we think. And especially during the Crusades, it became yeah. an important foothold for crusaders from Europe. I see. Now, of course, the Crusades were a time of conflict. Right. But together with conflict came a renewal of very tight exchanges, came proximity. And Armenia serving as this Christian enclave um, functioned as a stepping stone or a foothold and facilitated the importation of certain architectural components or elements into Christian Europe. I see. Now, these components had developed in very close contact with Byzantine and Islamic architecture, of course. Mm -hmm. There's clear documentation of architects of Armenian origin, for instance, serving at, at the later stage in the Ottoman army, but that was a tradition um, that had started long before. So there's a very clear connection, there's a very thick web of exchanges with Islamic and Byzantine architecture, and then through Armenia, we believe, was one of the main portals through which some of these elements arrived in uh, Christian Europe. I see. All right. We are talking to Carla Kevanian and we are discussing her module for the GAHTC on the medieval Mediterranean, which she describes as a crossroads. Uh, we will continue in just a minute. <laughs> 
this is Vikram Prakash, and we are talking with Carla Kevanian on Architecture Talk. Carla, we were talking about how Armenia served as a critical crossroads uh, between uh, the Christian Europe and the broader Islamic world of Eastern Asia. And we were starting to discuss the Crusades. And I just wanted to get your opinion on uh, the sort of pervasive effect of the Christian versus the Islamic Crusades, if you like. Do you think that contributed to the coloration of the discourse of the medieval period? Well, I think it certainly contributed to uh, coloring the medieval period or the period of the Crusades as one of great conflict. But one of the things that was particularly interesting to us, one of the reasons why we felt this had great current, of course, relevance, was the ongoing political discourse about this radical battle, if you want the phrase battle of civilizations emerged a few years ago, for instance. In Huntington, yeah. Right. Uh, between Christian Europe, if you want, or the West right. and Islam as two radically opposed worldviews. And in fact, this project, uh, when I first pitched it to my colleagues, it was actually uh, stemming from uh, an idea or an interest that I had for a few years. And it also stemmed from a specific political situation. And that is to say, um, you know, sometimes these events come together at particular moments in your own personal life. Right. And that is to say when in 2003, the U.S. troops entered Iraq and there was this outcry about the amount of artifacts that got destroyed or demolished. Mm -hmm. uh, then I was teaching my very first, uh, my very first uh, architectural survey course. I was at MIT. Uh -huh. And so it was a bit on the emotional wave about the number of artifacts that had been destroyed that I entered the classroom one day, I, I put together some slides of um, Islamic architecture. I'd taken a couple of uh, courses in graduate school, and I tried making the point about the contribution that um, the world of Islam, if you want, had made to the development of the West as well. Right. It all sort of started from there, from trying to point out, and so we come to the point of the medieval Mediterranean as a crossroads, to point out that architectural developments had occurred because of very fruitful exchanges or and mm. hybrids had emerged from that. Innovation had emerged from that. Right, right. And the point I was trying to make to my young students was culture exchanges have always been a major source of innovation. And I was trying to make that point through architecture by displaying the architecture. Uh, instead of this long-standing sent you know like a millennial long battle between the christian europe and the islamic exactly. uh, east asia which is portrayed uh, in huntington's book you know which is extremely controversial and yeah you know, disputable thesis right i mean exactly and somehow that still seems to be imbued in uh, a modern cultural understanding of the west certainly here in the united states still we can feel that yes in terms of these hybridizations and uh, cross currents of exchange, of course, you've already made the point really well that how uh, the great so-called canons of Western architecture were significantly uh, produced through its contact with the rest of the world. Uh, but I think you, there's also this uh, fascinating le the lecture three on uh, the Umayyad architecture, which uh, traces an alternate path out of the innovations of antiquity uh, versus the sort of traditional path uh, that is claimed by the 19th century worldview of the evol evolution of, you know, Romanesque architecture. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, other road in Lecture 3? Yes, absolutely. Um, this was one of the main building blocks of our argument, the argument that our project represented. Um, this lecture, titled Another Road Out of Antiquity, was prepared by Nasser Abbat, who teaches mm -hmm. Islamic architecture. Actually, he directs the Aga Khan program for Islamic architecture at MIT. Right. And the point this lecture makes is that um, while classical antiquity led to certain developments in medieval Christian Europe, mm 
It also served as a basis to some extent, or it actually influenced, of course, the regions where Islam developed. And so that Islam as well, as a young religion, Umayyad architecture, which was the earliest of monumental uh, Islamic architecture, looked also to the vestiges or the teachings of classical antiquity to draw inspiration. Right. And... Of course, they developed along different lines as with respect to what would happen in Christian Europe, but there are certain roots, if you want, that apply. So one of the things that I always tell my uh, students, my young students, is one of the reasons Islamic architecture actually looks rather familiar to us is because it also has some strong roots in classical architecture. Can you give us an example of, uh, of a clear derivation? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you look at the Great Mosque in Damascus, right. one of the great examples of Umayyad architecture, one of the earliest of examples, well, this, this mosque was actually founded on the remains of an ancient Roman temple. Oh, right, right. So even at that very basic level... It followed some of the schemes, the axis, the aisles that you would find in an early Christian basilica. There were certain differences, of course, that related to the way um, Islam, uh, the religion, the needs of the religion and, and the ways um, people worship. But there were some very clear um, similarities. Another example is the other great Umayyad monument, and that is to say the Dome of the mm -hmm, Rock, mm -hmm. which was very much similar to uh, Christian martyria, that is to say, uh, buildings which celebrated, say, a saint or the remains of a saint. So it had more of a circular or octagonal form, which in turn connected to ancient Roman monuments honoring right. the dead, which tended to be circular or form. So there's some very clear similarities there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that, in turn, rendered exchanges easier, in a way. Right. Because there were some common roots, and so hybridization became easier. One of the early theses that came across uh, in architectural historiography was that Islamic architecture actively uh, rooted itself into the various locations it found itself, in the sense that its expressions in East Asia, Middle Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia differed because what was critical to Islamic architecture was more its abstractions, which is to say its orientations, its qiblanes, you know, how it functioned, whereas in its actual forms, it adopted itself much more readily to various regions. How do you interpret this thesis in your work? Well, that seems to me a very reasonable mm -hmm. hypothesis, because it seems to me that is not only the case with um, Islamic monuments or buildings. That is a little bit the case with uh, many other architectural civilizations. You tend to adopt the materials that are available locally, and therefore you tend to adopt also the um, structural systems or the building practices that are available locally. That is just the practical, a pragmatic choice. So indeed, it becomes a thesis for all architecture. Is that not right? I mean, in fact, isn't that part of the point? Yeah. For all of architecture, at least in pre-modern times, yes. Because, for instance, we know, for instance, that, well, at least in, um, in pre-modern Europe, uh, cost of materials was the main cost of a building. It was about three quarters right. of the cost of a building was not manpower or labor. It was materials. So, of course, you wanted to source them as close to your building site as possible. And that in and by itself entails the fact that you're probably building with certain systems if you're using certain materials. And you're probably using manpower from around there. So you're probably using craftsmen, uh, people who are skilled in using those materials and, and know the building systems and practices that have employed traditionally those materials in that region. So that just makes right, sense, right. right? As you're saying, you have certain requirements, like which way it is oriented, which way you're going to pray, you need to have a Qibla wall and so on. In the case of Islamic architecture, and that is the case also in Christian churches. I mean, if you just look at Christian churches, 
they come in very many shapes and forms based on where they were built. I mean, I guess if I was to simply play devil's advocate, if we articulate yeah. all of architecture everywhere as the constant process of, if you like, regionalization, does it make any sense anymore to talk about an Islamic architecture or a Christian architecture of Western Europe? Are those terms even useful? Well, that, that's a really good question. And I think those terms are useful as a shorthand, but they definitely need to be rediscussed and understood. And actually, we made that partially, that point, in one of our lectures that looked at Romanesque architecture. Uh -huh. That is to say, the architecture, as an example, the architecture of the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries in Christian Europe. Now, we pointed out the fact that the very term Romanesque had ideological implications. It only emerged in the 19th century. And what it implied was that Christian Europe returned to the great lesson of Roman antiquity right. and uh, drew new life and produced new forms based on their right. understanding of Roman architecture. Now, in one of our lectures, we tried showing that even speaking of Romanesque architecture doesn't make much sense because the sort of architecture that developed, say, in Northern Europe, in France and Germany, say, what are today France and Germany, is very, very different than what developed in Southern yeah, right. uh, Europe, say, in Italy or Spain. So that the term itself carries with it an ideological implication that sort of throws a blanket across the architecture of a vast region such as Europe. And we showed that there were many more elements of influence coming from the East, and they affected the architecture of Christian Europe in different ways. They arrived in Italy before they arrived in Northern Europe right. because of the trade routes we were mentioning earlier. And so that using that term can work as shorthand, but we definitely need to start rediscussing these terms right. and their meaning. For Islamic architecture as well, we use that term as shorthand, but there are enormous differences, as, as you were pointing out, between, say, the architecture that developed along the eastern shores of the Mediterranean and what developed further inland, etc. So I think that's the interesting challenge about global history or global historiography is being able to simultaneously acknowledge and account for a certain localization while insisting on the persistent influence of non-local forces and seeing architecture as a shift shifting kaleidoscope and collage of these of these events right and I think, uh, you know, maybe towards the end here, we can turn towards uh, the Great Mosque of Cordoba, I think, which you cover in, uh, in Lecture 5. Uh, we have talked about how, you know, the great Western monuments uh, of Italy, for instance, were influenced by Islamic architecture. We have looked at how alternate trajectories out of antiquity emerged in uh, East Asia, in the Umayyad dynasties and the influence of the Armenian world. But here we are in Spain, in Islamic Spain. Would the reverse also work? What is the point you're making in your lecture? Is it fair to say that Cordoba, the great mosque at Cordoba, is an amalgamation of uh, the local and the broader Islamic world in, in a new and different way? Well, absolutely. Uh, we thought of Spain as a fundamental component of this project of ours to better understand the uh, rich exchanges that occurred between Christian Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean or the Islamic Mediterranean. Um, absolutely. Spain is a major example. And the reason the exchanges that must have occurred there over 400 years of Arab domination in such close proximity in, in the heart of Western Europe must have led to enormous changes and prolific outcomes, not just in architecture, right. mind you. Um, there are, of course, 
many studies that show the influence of Arab medicine, the Arab translations of Greek texts, for instance, uh, that were translated into Arab um, and then would, uh, were translated into Latin and so on, um, have been shown relatively recently to be at the basis of the understanding of medicine that occurs mm -hmm. in Christian Europe in these centuries. So um, the contribution of Arab translators and intellectuals and philosophers and astronomers and mathematicians and so on um, is widely studied. Of course, there's also these exchanges occurring with architecture. And absolutely uh, raising the, uh, the point there, the very valid point about this is exactly one of our efforts in thinking of global architectural history. I think we must exactly, as you were saying, focus on the local. And that is to say, look closely at the evidence, at the architectural evidence and the structural evidence, including the structural evidence. Look closely at that architecture in order to construct our arguments, which will help vaccinate us against broad ideological theories, general theories. And then when we've looked closely at that local, also understand how those local developments connect to other, a myri myriad other local developments and how together they create a network of exchanges. You know, the local itself is already global, right? Uh, in one sense. And what, you know, the sort of the terms have to be deconstructed in, to a certain extent. Right, absolutely. Because if you're thinking of local as one of the hubs of a broad network of exchanges, then yes, it becomes very global in its own terms. It's like you can see an entire network or an entire cosmos mm -hmm. reflected into a single maybe building or instance. That is also the historiographic approach I think we've tried having. And that is to say to look very closely at specific buildings to try and unravel the influences and evidence of exchanges that you can see through a careful examination of the architecture. So in conclusion, would you be willing to list or briefly describe the disparate sources that go into the Great Mosque of Cordoba? There again, we have a clear example, like in the Great Mosque, the Great Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. We have an example of buildings that already existed and were then rebuilt and readapted to new uses. We know about how the mosque in Cordoba developed and how it developed according to certain schemes and certain proportional ideas and schemes that came from the East. And then we also know, of course, that it was reutilized as a Christian cathedral and certain dramatic, drastic changes uh, occur there. But we also know of some elements that arrived from, for instance, uh, Syria, and for instance, the use of two tone, two colors of stone in the arches as a way of emphasizing an aesthetic appeal that is obtained through the use of different colors in the material itself. And that is one very clear example of how decorating arches that way, say by using limestone and brick to create a red and white pattern, or a different colored stone to create a white and black pattern, became one of the major features of Romanesque architecture again. Right, right. So we, we, we can trace these elements from Syria specifically, because this decorative practice uh, emerged, emerged for uh, in its earliest instances, as far as we know, in, in Syria, and then arrived through North Africa to Spain, and from there became a major feature uh, of Romanesque architecture. Again, quote-unquote Romanesque architecture. Yes, indeed. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Carla. Thank you for being on Architecture Talk, and I look forward to using your lectures in my own course. Thank you very much, Vikram. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. I'm Vikram Prakash, and our show's producer is Sadie Vechler. See you next time. Mm -hmm.